This episode brought to you by Honey, the easy way to save when shopping on your iPhone or computer. To the way of water cracking over two billion dollars. Yes, but we couldn't have done it without our chart queen, Charlie. All hail. Oh, gentlemen, please. I'm just the one who threw all the money at it. You're the ones who turned it into even more money. By following the charts. That's right. By rehashing a 13-year-old idea. It's already based on a 30-year-old idea. We proved that Hollywood is not out of ideas. Oh, and everyone's quoting it left and right. Right? I mean, <laughs> it is one of the top five highest grossing movies. Everyone must be quoting it, like... Bro? Bro! Bro! Yes, ah, yes, yes, absolutely. That was the best line in the script. What's a script? Oh, it's what actors read to make the movie happen. Oh, well, I hope none of my money went into that. <laughs> Not really, just effects. And even then, that's debatable. To manipulating the bare minimum. With money and charts. I'm sorry, who are you? Apology accepted. Um, uh, excuse me, but this is a private celebration. There's the famous cats who made the other famous cats. Oh, you're a fan of our work? Oh yeah. You made the cat film that came out in December, right? Yep, that's us. The one that lasted in theaters well past expectations. On the money. <laughs> the sequel to a film over a decade old that nobody knew they wanted. You flatter us, Mr. Uh... I'm sorry, what was your name again? The film everyone's still talking about. <laughs> Not everyone. Memes all over the internet, lines being referenced left and right. Countless videos discussing its themes, characters, and story. That doesn't sound like our work. Oh. Someone already else it does. Oh, I mean, that's what you get when you think outside the box. Yes, the box office has shown us that we are the masters of storytelling. Hey, I never do this, but can I get your autograph? <laughs> oh, certainly. Do you have a pen or something, person who used to be standing right in front of me? Hey, where do you go? Ah! Sign right here. Oh, you accidentally brought the wrong one. You meant this. Oh, well, look at the time. I've got to be terrified somewhere else. <laughs> we too have a five o'clock pan shitting. Vomitus. Go, go, go. We gotta get it. Come on. Ah! Oh. 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 You're not living up to the hype. Pick it up. Pick it up. Who are you? Oh, I'm exactly what you think I am. Not metaphorically, or rhetorically, or poetically, or theoretically, or any other fancy way. I am. Just really excited for you to watch this! What? For some reason when this movie came out, everybody was comparing it to the show Velma. I don't really know why either. They're both animated. Um, they're both comedies, supposedly. They're both movies? No wait, they're not. I didn't get this comparison. To me, Avatar The Way of Water was the real comparison. They're both sequels to films that came out a little over a decade ago. Both clearly animated. Both came out around the Christmas season. And both lasted longer than expected in theaters. But where the adult one wanted to look real and basically had a script for children, the children's one wanted to feel real and basically had a script for adults. If you told me one of these scripts took 10 years to write, going off of the previous film's ideas and expanding them while also evolving the characters with satisfying arcs, I wouldn't have guessed it's this expensive Save the Whales bumper sticker. 
That's why nobody's talking about Avatar 2 outside of the technology in the box office, yet people are still talking about Puss in Boots 2 for its imagination and storytelling. The things you're supposed to talk about when you see a good movie. It wasn't even a sequel people demanded to exist. I think I speak for most when I say the first Puss in Boots was... passable. Clearly he was a breakout character from the Shrek movies, but nobody was really clamoring to see the film again. With the sequel though, people were still seeing it on the big screen, even after it came out on streaming and Blu-ray. That's pretty damn impressive. So, what is it that won over so many people, still resulting in fan art, gifts, millions of hits on videos, and... the Megan dance? I'm calling the police. Let's take a closer look to find out. Unless we want to talk about the hidden layers of that other cat movie. No, 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 we got it just fine, thank you. Environment good, people bad. Oh, I just want to see my family again. We'll see. This is Puss in Boots' The Last Wish. The film opens with the only song in the movie, so thankfully, it's pretty catchy. Who is your favorite fearless hero? Puss is played again by Antonio Banderas, who has taken over the corrupt governor's house and is throwing a fiesta. And I knew this movie was at least going to be funny by two opening jokes. One being when a father lets his son's face get stepped on by Puss's boots. He stepped on my face! And we will never wash it again. And the other being when the governor returns home, resulting in this line. Welcome! Mi casa es su casa. No, su casa es mi casa! That is so clever I want to stalk it online so I can obsess over how much better it is than me. Light it up! I'll admit, at first I thought this intro was great, but a little pointless. Like all I wanted to do was show off a cool action sequence. A friggin' giant shows up out of nowhere and never returns. But watching it again, it does show how reckless Puss is with his life. He's helping others, which is great, but he's also clearly addicted to the thrill and the attention. You can see why Death would be so pissed watching him be so careless with what he has. Which, by the way... Damn it, this movie's good! I guess I should also address the animation up front, as it's very different from the other Puss in Boots and Shrek movies. The designs are pretty similar, but the textures have more of a painted look and it constantly skips frames, meaning there's fewer motion blurs or smearing as it's sometimes called in animation, and often joked about in memes. I've seen people split on this, and honestly, I didn't know if I'd be into it, but I grew to love it real fast for two reasons. One, it looks more like a fairy tale illustration. Shrek wanted to do more of a trollish satire of fairy tales, so the more real, but also kind of ugly textures made sense for the style. This wants to be an adventurous action film, like a mix between anime and a spaghetti western that just happens to take place in a fairy tale. So I feel like it blends these styles perfectly. Two, I've discovered I remember the motion more with fewer frames. It's been proven you can get across more visual information in animation than live action. Which makes sense, it is reality reduced down to fewer, but more vibrant colors and lines. This movie knows this and therefore throws a lot at you very quickly. It's like an adrenaline rush. The skipped frames help you remember the imagery more than if they added more realistic blurs. Try it. Let's compare Puss in Boots fighting in Shrek 2 in slow motion. <laughs> compared to Puss in Boots here in slow motion. If you pause it randomly during an action sequence, everything looks like a beautiful painting or 3D comic book panel. I know the style is becoming more popular, and while I wouldn't want to see it everywhere, I do like variety. If it's done with the right project, it can create imagery that'll last with you forever. The legend will never die! Speaking of forever, Puss in Boots is killed after defeating the giant, resulting in him showing up at the doctor trying to figure out how many of his nine lives he has left. This is another example of the film doing way more than it needs to. All these jokes are pretty funny, showing the various ways he died. But not only are there hidden jokes, like Puss not only wins against the dogs playing poker painting, but also wins with five aces and another one hidden in his hat. But look at these title cards. All they need to do is show a number, but they include a creative drawing tied to his death. Death is even seen in the corners of each one as he gets closer and closer. Is this amazing? No, but the film has a million little touches like this that add up more and more. Case in point, when he's told he's on his last life, Puss laughs off the danger and goes to a bar to drink shots of cream. Another glass of cream. Make it your heaviest. Oh, I keep the heavy stuff in the back. 
That's funny enough, have you noticed he has eight glasses empty? And he's drinking his ninth just as death walks in? This whole movie feels like Eddie Valiant's desk scene. I just love how much they're sneaking in without you even being aware of it. There's the famous hat, the feather, and of course, the boots. As Wagner Mora as death, doing one hell of a job giving this creepy ass thing a creepy ass voice. Can I get your autograph signed right there? The complaint is, it takes Puss way too long to figure out who he is. Puss in books laps in the face of death. So I've heard. I just assume he put together this was the Grim Reaper, but I guess that's a big twist in the middle that is about as shocking as Judge Doom being the bad guy. Yeah, I don't know what's up with all these Roger Rabbit references either. Pick it up. Pick it up. For the first time, Puss may have met his match, shown beautifully in this reflection shot of Puss being disoriented, which will flip in the climax with Death being disoriented. And he decides to flee. Corre, corre, gatito. Now all they have to do is show him going to an old cat lady's house the doctor recommended when he retires. One shot, easy. Instead, it's shown to us in this cool way. Damn it, you're puss in boots too! Nobody's expecting you to try! He buries his clothes and sword, and I love the way he does so like a real cat. Not just because it looks hilarious, but you could argue it's him getting ready for his life as a domesticated animal. As we get some really funny scenes with Divine Joy Randolph as the weird cat lady. This is my home. And now it's your home too. Your forever home. And we're shown the equivalent of a retirement home for cats he ultimately surrenders to. You're a talking cat? I'm a talking cat. Let's talk. Okay, so if you're like me, you got your Olaf from Frozen 2 Cross and Gurgi from Black Cauldron Holy Water, but Perito, played by Harvey Gillian, admittedly does walk that line, but never crosses it. His story is pretty decent. He wants to be a therapy dog, but is pretending to be a cat because nobody wants him as a pet. What could they possibly want to offer Puss in Boots? What's a Puss in Boots? Seriously? While his jokes are hit and miss, his chipper personality balances out when we find out later what a depressing life he has without even knowing it. We'll get to that a little later, but I don't think I say this often, I'm pretty sure this comic relief wouldn't have worked if they didn't have the dramatic moments. Speaking of drama, three bears led by Goldilocks, played by Florence Pugh, are searching for Puss in Boots and she tells the bears who have only snarled and growled up to this point to rough up the cat lady resulting in this. Excuse me, my darling. We're looking for the legendary Puss in Boots. No, it's a decent joke, but that's not all it is. These bears actually do have distinct, likable personalities. They apparently like having Goldie as a member of the family, but want to help her out in finding a fallen star that's said to grant one wish. All of your guts for garters. Oh, too hard. That was not just right. Again, if I had to nitpick, I would say they probably do the just right joke a few too many times. These ones are just right. It will make everything just right. The day when our world became just right. Oh, that is just right. <laughs> but it does tie into the message, and the film is meant to also entertain kids, so I give it a pass. That star has one wish to grant. One wish. Puss in Boots hears about the star and a treasure map needed to find it and also make the wish. And it looks like it's in the hands of Big Jack Horner, played hilariously by John Mulaney. Excuse me? Could you do the thumb thing? Like in the fairy tale? It wasn't a fairy tale. It was only a nursery rhyme. Look at the design of this guy. He looks like a Monty Python cartoon mixed with a drag version of Brain's robot body. Everything about this guy is pretty damn funny. Even his quick backstory gets a good laugh. What's impressive? I've been a boy the whole time. Yeah! <laughs> Wouldn't be the first time Pinocchio beat you. Does it mean there's technically four of these that came out last year then? Are those unicorn horns? Baby unicorn horns. Oh yeah, this film also has the crazy mean-spiritedness of the best Shrek movies. Like when one of these sisters is told she'll carry her weight in gold, the Midas touch turns her into exactly that. And she never wakes up. Yeah, the body count adds up to 23, which doesn't include these poor people that couldn't have survived this. Focus! Hand over that map or I'll punch holes in the lot of ya. Again, love a PG movie that actually has a reason to be PG. Booze? Kitty? Pools. Kitty. <laughs> He's intercepted by Kitty Softpaws, played again by Selma Hayek who it turns out is looking to find the wishing star too. You have a lot of nerve coming back here. I was the best thief you ever hired. You robbed me. God damn it, some of these jokes are good. 
Puss and Kitty escape with the map, with Goldie and Jack following closely behind with his baker's dozen. By the way, wonder where he got those unicorn's horns from? This movie has so much extra credit, it's making all the other movies want to kick his ass in class! So tell us how you became an internet sensation, and by that I mean a ridiculous meme. Well, one doesn't try to be a meme. I mean, it's not like for years of trying to force memes down people's throats. Yes, that would be incredibly obvious and cringy. Exactly, but honestly, it was all because of Honey. People forget that was a Honey sponsorship that I was doing that for. You know how when you find a good deal you feel smart, lucky, and excited? It's such a great surprise to find you're suddenly saving so much money. I was trying to reflect that subtly in that meme. Yes, it was so subtle I didn't even realize I was looking at a person. Mm. Because thanks to Honey, manually searching for coupon codes is a thing of the past. Honey is the free shopping tool that scours the internet for promo codes and applies the best one it finds to your cart. And I think all that comes across in the performance I gave. Look at all the layers to this meme. The fear of excitement, the excitement of fear. That weird thing in my neck that kind of looks like a hickey, but was probably just me showering with the water too hot. You are dangerously pale. And palely dangerous. What? I don't know. But imagine you're shopping on one of your favorite sites. When you check out, the Honey button appears, and all you have to do is click Apply Coupons. Wait a few seconds as Honey searches for coupons it can find for that site. If Honey finds a working coupon, you'll watch the prices drop. That's how I brought myself to tears. I actually broke down on camera. Those are real tears you're seeing there just because of how excited I was to get a good deal with honey. I also hit myself a lot in the crotch, but mostly it was the honey stuff. Mm, yes. I actually saved a lot on a tablet I got recently. Look at the percentage of how much I saved. I've even used it in the past for getting movies. How can you not be moved to tears over that? Was honey easy to use? It was so easy, it was simple. Wow. Wow. And Honey doesn't just work on desktops, it works on your iPhone too. Just activate it on Safari on your phone and save on the go. Is it safe to say if you don't already have Honey, you could straight up be missing out? And by doing so, you'll be doing us a solid by supporting the show. Yes, which show exactly? Whatever weird show this is. The person I'm not talking to is clearly just my voice on the other end. Very odd indeed. Perhaps we should tell people they can get PayPal Honey for free at joinhoney.com slash nostalgia. That's joinhoney.com slash nostalgia. I, for one, would like to thank Honey for inspiring this meme that no doubt changed an entire generation. Yes, it's such an achievement to have people all over the world say, Who is this bald freak and why is there always a gif of him on my computer? You have nothing to say that at, do you? You're just gonna keep nodding. You're trying to make another meme, aren't you? Sad. It's not going to work. But Honey works. Go do this thing. So the map seems to change depending on whoever holds it, and again, all they have to do is show everyone heading to the dark forest where the star is said to be. But they show it like this. This film is trying to take those end credit collages that are trying to make the film you just watched look better and actually make the film better with it. They enter through a portal to get to the dark forest, but just like the map, the forest seems to change depending on whoever's holding it, reflecting their emotional stability or instability. Why does he get the good one? Wander the fields of quick and easy solutions and arrive at the star! How every kid thinks being a YouTuber works. Like I mentioned, sometimes the messages can be a little hammered in. Don't rush through it! Take your time and really appreciate what's right in front of you. Hey, you could tie this into him wanting to be a therapy dog and calm people down. But B, it gets to the harsh stuff fast. Perito says he doesn't want to make a wish because he's so happy with his friends and family. Where are they, you might ask? Well, they're playing a very holy shit version of hide and go seek. They put me in a sock with a rock in it and then throw me in a river. <laughs> Whoa, daddy. Yeah, I think Kitty's reaction there sums it up. My jaw was on the floor when I saw this. I couldn't believe this film was going that dark. I feel like a lesser flick would have him eventually figure out what was going on, but I like that he never does. You can either save that for a sequel or honestly, never address it. Because he always manages to look on the bright side, and whether it's through cleverness or idiocy, it helps things to work for him, even when things don't work for him. They balance it out pretty well. Excalibur! Yeah, I couldn't get this rock off of it, but it's still pretty cool, right? Meanwhile, Jack searches for weapons to take on the threats of the forest, leading to the discovery of his conscience. Which, as you'd imagine, is very tiny. 
I, I don't cast spells. Well, what do you do? Well, I, I, I judge you. His Jimmy Stewart voice is similar to Animaniacs having Kirk Douglas as Michelangelo. I have no idea why, but by God, it's funny. <laughs> He just gets funnier and funnier when he watches Jack accidentally kill half his staff trying to get the map from Puss. You're not gonna shoot a puppy, are you, Jack? Yeah, in the face. Why? <laughs> so that's what they do. Oh, how non-grotesquely grotesque. Death keeps appearing to Puss in a lot of cool skull imagery, resulting in Goldie getting the map and Puss having a panic attack. I doubt I'm alone on this. I think this is Perito's best scene. See what I mean? Just when you're one step away from saying, I'm gonna lose my shit if he says Hakuna anything, suddenly you're like, I'm not crying, my emotions are just leaking! Puss reveals that the reason Kitty is so angry at him is because he abandoned her on their wedding day. I just wish I hadn't hurt her so badly. I regret that day. An action like this would be pretty tough to forgive for a main character, but they really do make us identify with his thrill addiction and his fear of giving it all up. It also helps that Kitty didn't show up either. I knew I could never compete with your one true love. Who? Yourself. You don't seem like that guy anymore. So I'm not gonna pretend this is like a great romance or anything, but the two do have a believable connection. And I don't think they're trying to sell them as the best couple, as opposed to the only people who really understand what the other's going through. On that note, Goldie and the Bears discover nostalgic pines. Yeah, people don't know I was bred there where they see a perfect recreation of their old home. The day a little orphan girl broke into our cabin and stole our hearts. Though she says she's looking for her family, her book of fairy tales suggests she already has it. No, literally, the first letter of the left side of the book spells out, you already have it. Followed by, and they lived happily ever after. That is some Edward Norton Dave Batista drink shit right there. Jack, on the other hand, says his wish is to have all the magic in the world to take it over. Leading to this meme that also kind of took over the world. That was horrible! You're horrible! Oh, oh, what took you so long, idiot? I can't pick which version of this meme is the funniest, so I'll just pick the weirdest. You're horrible! Oh, oh, what took you so long? <laughs> Right? Pretty goddamn odd. The cats get the map back, but it's snatched away halfway through transforming, giving way to yet another creative action sequence. Yeah, whenever people say animation is just for kids, remember you're watching something where this can happen. You can't see something like this in live action. Or if you can, you have to use CG animation. But whatever, it's all just to babysit your kids, ha ha ha. Yeah, screw it, if those are the only options, I'm not gonna choose to be a boring, miserable adult. I'm gonna choose to be a happy, interesting kid. The cats get the map, but the bears get Perito. Just as Puss gets caught in a cave, having an existential crisis with his past lives. The proper party now that all nine of us are here. Yeah! yeah. <laughs> you know what? I love you guys! I kind of feel like he's talking with his younger years, like, these are his carefree college days. Like, I can totally see them recreating Jackass while on Pineapple Express catnip. You will always live a life of fear! Death reminds him his carefree days are behind him, though, as the end is near. And because he never valued what he had, he's gonna take his last life early. <laughs> Don't make me jealous there's not a haunted house based around you. Seriously, someone get on that. He escapes and gets to the star just as Kitty saves Perito and shows up behind him. Goldie and the Bears aren't far behind either as she reveals she wants to use her wish to get away from them and find her real family. The Bears are heartbroken, but in a nice twist, they still see her as family and want to help. And whether you think we're your family or not, if this is something that will make you happy, we'll get you that wish. <laughs> Kitty sees Puss making the wish and thinks he's being selfish again, but he says that death is after him just in time to see, well, everybody's after them. This is clearly a send up to the good, the bad, and the ugly, which the film takes a lot of inspiration from. And on top of another great action sequence, Goldie gives up her wish to save her true family. Like I told you, baby! You're the smash, I'm the crab. Yes! And if you've noticed, her appearance reflects that. 
Her clean, multicolored look becomes more muddy and brown the more she realizes she should probably stay with the bears, thus looking more like them. This movie might be too good. It needs a Modoc or something. Put Modoc in there. Perito says he doesn't need a wish as one life is more than enough for him, which death comes to put to the test for puss. This time he doesn't run away though as he finally has something of value worth fighting for. Lives flashing before your eyes? No, just one. The one where I got it done with Kitty Catswell. Who? I'm not topping that! The fight is about as beautifully laid out as you can imagine, but Death gets fed up when he sees he no longer runs away, but also doesn't think he's invincible either. I came here for an arrogant little legend who thought he was immortal. But I don't see him anymore. But that could be because I'm colorblind. Everything looks red to me. What color are you? I'm looking for an orange cat. Are you orange? Jack Horner comes back though after turning himself bigger, and at first I didn't like that everybody else had an arc aside from him, like everyone can find the way except for this one a-hole I guess. But firstly you could argue there just aren't enough remaining years for him to convert. Like maybe someone could change, they would just need several lifetimes to do it. But second, I kinda miss anime villains, they're just straight up evil. Yeah, I like sympathy for my baddies, but since we already have antagonists who are relatable in this and it's been so long since we've had an anime villain who's not a surprise or misunderstood, he's just plain mean. I'm open up to him more. You go to hell, Jack Corner. You go to hell and you die. Consider this my resignation, mister. The map is destroyed, so the star is destroyed and everyone goes home to their newfound families. Except the bug, he still gets shit on. Hold still. Oh, no, no, wait just a second. Oh, God. Just imagine he has this face and he won't feel so bad. The ending teases another Shrek sequel in the near future and... Honestly, I don't need it! Give me Puss in Boots 3! Talk about making lemonade from lemons. Where the hell did this movie come from? In an age where IP is being beaten to death and old tricks are just becoming older tricks, this movie has so much passion, so much style, so many little touches while still working off of timeless themes and ideas. Are the lessons in this really that new? Not really. Some people even say for what they got, the movie was overhyped. And honestly, I can see how someone would think that. I think it's similar to when I first saw Back to the Future. Like the buildup was so much, I was kind of shocked to find it was simply a well-made movie. But if a well-made movie is made really well, it can kind of be like the cheeseburger from the menu. It breathes new life into something you thought had no more life in it. Make you remember the charm and excitement of watching something people clearly put their blood, sweat, and tears into. And sure, lots of films people put their blood, sweat, and tears into, but the great films make you feel that devotion in every frame, every shot, every hidden easter egg, every unique angle, every line delivery. It tries to do more than what's expected of it without forgetting what it is. A smart, funny, emotional, action-packed adventure everyone can get into. Even though they repeated it again and again, I think Goldie put it best when she said, it's just right. Will Hollywood learn to turn out more films like this? I have an idea! Puss in Boots goes to Pandora! Oh, and then they can meet up with, mm, name one of the characters from those movies. Nobody can. Take my money anyways! I guess that's a start. I'm a nostalgia critic, I remember it, so you don't have to. Oh, you're still here? <laughs> this month for Cameos for Charity, we're doing the Children's Health Foundation in Ireland. I actually sat next to some of these people at the convention I was at when I was in Dublin, and their cause seemed really wonderful, so I decided to dedicate this whole month to them. Children's Health Foundation raises vital funds to support sick children and their families in Children's Health Ireland hospitals and urgent care centers in Crumlin, Temple Street, Tallet, and Connolly. If you check out their website, you can see all the various ways they try to help children and also the creative ways they try to raise money and awareness. So if you want a cameo from me saying happy birthday or congrats, good luck or whatever, just click on the link below and you'll be giving to a good cause. Or if you're like, I don't like you, no. Well, check out their website anyway and see all the good that they do. It's wonderful people helping wonderful kids and you can play a big part in helping them out.